right, everyone say, hi, Japan. <laughs> everyone say, hi, Christ Bible Seminary. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm uh, not Japanese, but I still like cameras. <laughs> It's a tremendous joy to be with you all. Thank you, Chaplain Kellogg and President Litvin, for your uh, very kind uh, invitation to be here. Uh, I went to seminary at Trinity in nearby Deerfield, uh, but I was born and raised in the Philadelphia area, very close to the public schools uh, where my wife and I used to teach. Every year during open house, the parents would walk into my room and, and sit at their children's uh, desks. And every year as they stared looking at me with a bit of a strange look on their faces, as all of you are, I would uh, open with the same words. Don't worry, I'm older than I look. So anyway, uh, before we start, why don't I answer the question uh, that's burning inside everyone's mind so we can just concentrate on the important topic that's before us. Uh, are you ready? You see, I can, I can read minds, you know. Here's the answer. 37. So the theme of my talk today is Come Be a Nobody for Christ. And this is very appropriate because, first of all, you all have no idea who I am. <laughs> so let me start off by uh, sharing a little bit about my background and also my family's background. Uh, my father's name was not always Sung Yu Oh, a Korean name. As a child growing up under the Japanese occupation of Korea, he was forced to take the name Hideo Matsuyama, a Japanese name. If he used his Korean name or spoke Korean, he would be beaten. And now I, his son, serve as a missionary among the people he was taught to hate. And there is perhaps good reason, humanly speaking, to hate the Japanese. We talk about the horrors of the Holocaust when Nazi Germany killed 6 million Jews and 20 million Russians. According to Thomas Chalmers, historian Thomas Chalmers, the Japanese slaughtered as many as 30 million Filipinos, Vietnamese, Cambodians, Indonesians, Koreans, and Chinese. There was a Holocaust in Asia, but no one seems to have noticed. Imperial Japanese scientists tested chemical and biological weapons such as uh, bubonic plague and anthrax on human victims. Women were impregnated by soldiers and doctors, their bellies sliced open, their babies removed and then tested upon, leading to their death. Nazi scientists who visited Japanese medical experimentation facilities vomited from the horror of what they saw. 200,000 Korean women and girls as young as 12 years old were forced to be sex slaves of the Japanese Imperial Army, subject to rape upwards of 100 times per day. They are known today euphemistically as the comfort women. Uh, by the way, all of these uh, pictures uh, were taken by Japanese soldiers as souvenirs. It should come as no surprise, then, that the question that people most often ask me about our mission work is, why Japan? Koreans ask me that. Americans ask me that. And Japanese even ask me, why Japan? And the answer that I give is quite simply, Jesus said, love your enemies. I was speaking at a conference with 2,000 college students, and during the Q&A time, someone raised their hand and asked me the question, what do you like most about Japan? And for about 45 seconds, I was completely at a loss for words. I just had no idea how to answer that question. And then finally I said, you know, there's something just inappropriate about the word like in terms of how I feel about Japan and why I'm in Japan. You know, first of all, I'm not in Japan because I like sushi. 
or Japanese comic books or PlayStation. Um, I think for some people, the thought of being a missionary is so perplexing that they assume that, that there must be some reasonable explanation. They must like sushi or something. And secondly, sushi fan. Secondly, although I admit that there's really uh, not much that I like about Japan, I can say with all my heart, I love, I love the Japanese, and I'm willing to lay my life down that they might know Jesus. Because not only is there earthly reason to hate the Japanese, there is also a very good biblical reason to love the Japanese. They are a nation that is spiritually lost. They worship eight million gods, but so few know the true, the one true God. The Protestant population in Japan is 0.2%. There are 183,000 cult groups registered with the government. They are a nation that is also sexually lost. The historical legacy of the so-called uh, comfort women that I mentioned before is today continued as there are 150,000 Filipino and Thai women who are being exploited in the Japanese sex industry, having been lured by so-called entertainment jobs. I was in Thailand attending the 2004 Lausanne Forum where I met Patricia Green, the founder of Rahab Ministries, where they seek to rescue Thai uh, girls from prostitution. She told me that 70% of tourists who enter into Thailand are men. 70% of those men participate in the sex industry. And the majority of those men are Japanese. I've walked the streets of Pattaya, Thailand with friends, praying with tears in my eyes, as I saw not only women involved in prostitution walking hand in hand with their Japanese clients, but also young girls and young boys. And they are a nation that is also relationally lost. There's a phenomenon known as hikikomori, where people refuse to work or participate at all in normal life. Uh, they sleep all day, and if they venture out at all, it's at night to their local convenience store to pick up some cup of noodles and some pornography. There are today in Japan more than one million young men who are hikikomori. Young girls in Japan are so desperately seeking fatherly attention that many have even turned to teenage prostitution. Having a dirty old man touch you and pay you doesn't seem to me like a fair substitute for a father's love. One study says that upwards of 9% of high school girls have participated in enjo kosai, or a type of dating prostitution. Imagine nine girls out of every hundred girls from your high school. Even upwards of 4% of junior high school girls, junior high school girls report having participated in such prostitution. The Japanese need the Lord and our love as well. So many people leave college with the goal to be somebody. And being somebody usually means uh, getting a really good job, making good money, buying a really nice house, driving a really nice car, attaining some important position, and helping your kids to do the same. For the Christian, being somebody usually means all of that and faithfully going to church on Sundays and Bible study during the week. But I believe that Jesus Christ is calling for people to be a nobody for him. People who would forsake the American dream to be a part of bringing gospel hope to the nations. People who don't mind if they're not recognized, respected, rewarded, praised, or promoted. As long as the name of Jesus is cherished and worshipped, exalted, and adored. I believe that Jesus Christ is calling for well-trained, well-educated, godly, capable, wise, talented nobodies. Uh, two nights ago, I was having dinner with John Piper, 
And I love how he sums up reality so clearly and challenges us so passionately. And Piper says very simply that we have only three choices. Go, send, or disobey. And it's my hope and prayer that the very best and brightest of your generation will go and bring gospel hope to the nations. Young men and women who could have been somebody in this world choosing to be nobodies for Jesus Christ. To be an unknown, unappreciated, unrecognized servant of the Lord among the lost of this world. And that doesn't mean, you know, that you have to go and be a preacher. I don't think that there's a single job, actually, or profession that you can have here in America that you can't do in the mission field. You can be a musician, a physician, a professor, a dog catcher, a secretary, an actuary, a bartender, a mixed martial arts fighter, for all I care. Uh, Well, maybe not the last two. Uh, My point is simply that... Doing that missions is, is, is doing what the Lord has gifted and called you to do where there are few or no Christians so that those who cannot be saved without believing in the gospel can hear that life-giving gospel through you as you practice medicine, preach, or whatever it is that you do. Uh, Can I give a practical and uh, basic challenge to think about? Uh, One challenge that I often extend when I'm speaking uh, is to give at least a tithe of your money and a tithe of your life for reaching the unreached peoples of the world. Uh, But honestly speaking, usually when when I give that challenge, I'm speaking to a group of people who are so entrenched in this capitalistic consumer world that the idea of giving God 10% of their money is radical. And these are people who are so committed to making their lives comfortable, physically, economically, relationally, emotionally, and spiritually comfortable that the idea of giving anything more than a week to share Christ with an African or a Muslim is radical. But that's what I, why I love speaking to college students, because it's not too late for you all. I can say these things and your hearts and your minds and your wallets are not yet so corrupted that a little bit of what I'm saying makes sense to you. Honestly, I think that in terms of finances, that a tithe to the church and a tithe to reaching the unreached is aiming too low for most people. If your family has $60,000 in assets, you are the richest 10% of the world. For most Americans, that's just the two cars that are in your garage. If you have $500,000 in assets in your family, you would be, which, would, which would be the house that is attached to your garage with your two cars, um, you are the richest 1% of this world. America is the richest nation in the world and the richest nation in the history of mankind. So I ask you, is giving 10% to the church and 10% to reaching the unreached peoples of the world asking too much? Or is it asking too little? When people ask me, how how much should I give to the church and to missions? I, I tell them, give sacrificially. Think about the gospel and give sacrificially. Don't give uh, God the crumbs that fall from your table. In other words, don't give God the leftovers, uh, your quote-unquote disposable income. I'm sure that phrase was invented in America. Uh, Giving God your disposable income is like kind of like, you know, reaching under your couch cushion, finding extra money, you know, that you don't need, and saying, here, here God, it's, it's all yours. You can have it all. Go save the world. Go save the world. Those of you who are sitting up front, uh, do me a favor and take all the coins home with you so that the custodial staff doesn't uh, boycott my ever being invited back. Uh, Those are Japanese coins, by the way. Japanese gens doing... (laughs) 
Last week when I was speaking at Covenant College, uh, the missionary sitting up front took them all. (laughs) I believe that true, really God-honoring giving begins at the point of sacrifice. When it really starts to cost you something. Um, Guys, next time you go on a date with your girlfriend, um, you guys are allowed to date here at Wheaton? (laughs) Yes? Okay. I just came from the South preaching at a Christian college, so. Next time you go on a date with your girlfriend, guys, um, try giving her something that costs you nothing. No money, (laughs) no time, and no effort whatsoever, and you'll see exactly what I mean. (laughs) Can her boyfriend see me after chapel? (laughs) Jesus' greatest offering to the Father was in sacrificing himself on the cross. Jesus gave not only his sweat and tears, but his blood. So if the Lord is calling you to business or medicine or law or some other high-paying job and to stay here in America, by all means make gobs of money, but also sacrificially give eye-popping, scandalously huge amounts of it away for the glory of Christ around the world. It's not your money to give. It's God's money to invest. Nor is it your life to give. Your life is not your own. So won't you consider investing even just a tithe of your life for Christ's glory among the unreached peoples of the world? More than two billion people who live in the nations of the 1040 window have little or no opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ unless someone will go. What could possibly be so important here in America? What could possibly be more important to do here in America than bringing the only chance at salvation in the gospel message to the lost whom God created for his glory? Some Christians in America have a very legitimate answer to that question. They have a calling to send. They have a calling to build up others who can go. Many others have never even thought about that question. So I ask you all to consider giving a tithe or more of your life for Christ's glory among the nations. You know, um, some people decide to do this after they retire and praise the Lord for them. Uh, But why don't you consider giving God the best six years of your life while you are young and and healthy and, and strong? And like I said, there's almost nothing that you can do here in America, no job or profession that you can't do in the mission field. We each have been given just one life. The measure of your life will not be what is is gained or accomplished in this world. The measure of your life will be what is gained for Christ for eternity. The measure of your life will be the glory that Jesus Christ receives globally and eternally. Don't waste your life making a name for yourself, but give your everything, give your everything that the name of Jesus might be exalted among the nations. As for me, I'm, I'm a nobody. Um, in fact, that's been confirmed by an important and old leader in Asia. Uh, in the middle of a meeting recently, uh, my name came up, and this was his response. Uh, who is Michael O? He's not even really Korean. He leads just a small school in Japan. Uh, Even the more important Japanese leaders don't know him. I don't know why he's on the executive committee of Lausanne. And when I heard this, um, I rejoiced. (sighs) 
Who is Michael O? Nobody. Praise the Lord. That night I, I wrote in my journal, Lord, make me like the widow of Mark 12, nameless and poor, but pouring out all of the little that I have for Jesus Christ. I aspire to be like that widow, attracting the derision of vaunted and venerable leaders and attracting the compassion and attention of my Lord. Tonight, may the Lord help me to pour out my two coins worth for his glory. You know, I, I could have been a somebody. Everyone who knows me knows that I could have made a ton of money if I wanted. Um, I have four Ivy League degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard University. I have three master's degrees and a PhD. Uh, between my sister, uh, whose college roommate actually teaches here at Wheaton, by the way, uh, Chris Lake, I think is her um, married name, uh, between my sister, my two brothers-in-law, my wife, and me, uh, we have 15 college and graduate degrees, uh, including degrees from Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Cornell, and the University of Pennsylvania. And now all five of us are either missionaries or heading to the mission field. When lots of people hear this, they think it's tragic, tragic. But others see it like the pouring of ridiculously expensive and per precious perfume upon the feet of Jesus. So why, why, why choose to be a nobody when you could be a somebody? Why? Because life is not about us. Life is not about us. It's not about how much money you can make. It's not about how secure and comfortable you can be. It's not about making a name for yourself. It's not even about living a quiet life and going to church on Sundays. Not only is it not about us, it's, it's also not even about them, about the Japanese or other nations and peoples that are lost without the gospel. Ultimately, it's about God. It's about God who, who deserves to hear from every single one of his servants for whom he died. Lord, I would go anywhere for you. Lord, I would do anything for you. It's about Christians realizing that we have absolutely no right to tell God, I'll do this and this for you, but not that or that. It's about Christians understanding how globally and cosmically worthy he is to be worshipped and glorified and adored, and how incredibly hard the task of making him known is, and how great the sacrifices needed are to see that happen. It's about Christians who so want Jesus Christ to be somebody to every tribe, language, people, and nation that they are willing to be a nobody to see it happen. You know, my father always wanted me to be somebody, and he did everything possible to make that happen. My parents came to this country with a few hundred dollars in their pockets, uh, but eventually we moved out of our inner city apartment and began to make a pretty good living. And then one Sunday during my senior year in college, I had lunch with my father and told him that I wanted to be a missionary. His response, no. And then he said, Michael, I I want you to stay in America, and I, and I want to see you at church every single Sunday with your children and have lunch together like this. But then I said to him, Dad, I, I appreciate everything that you have done for me. That's why I can be where I am today. But I refuse to live my life just to try to get into a good college and so I can get a good job and make lots of money so that my kids can have every opportunity to go to a good college and get a good job and make lots of money so that their kids can have every opportunity to get into a good college and get a good job and make lots of money. I refuse to live my life like that. I don't remember what he said to me after that. Uh, maybe he just dropped me off at my dorm room or maybe he made me walk. Um, but I ask you, is that why Jesus died? So that we can get a good job and make lots of money, so that our kids can have every opportunity to get into a good college and get a good job and make lots of money. Did Jesus die so that we could be comfortable? 
Did Jesus die so that we could be somebody and go to church on Sundays? You know, each one of you, after you graduate, you can be somebody. You can build your own kingdom. You can make a name for yourself. You can be really, really comfortable. You can be respected. You can be recognized. And you can help your kids be somebody as well. Or you can be a nobody for Jesus Christ. I invite you to be a nobody for Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, thank you. Thank you that you emptied yourself, that you laid down your glory and your majesty and you came to this earth and made yourself nothing, that you became a nobody for the glory of the Father all around this world. Would you grant us courage and faith and strength and humility, O Lord, to walk in your footsteps again for your glory and the glory of the Father, both here and to the very ends of the earth. In Christ's name, amen. You're watching WETN-TV, a broadcasting service of Wheaton College. For a copy of this program, please call the Media Resources Department of Wheaton College at 752-5061.